Well, good morning, First Baptist Church. Welcome to worship online this morning. For our call to worship, we'll be reading from Psalm chapter 77. It says this, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. I remembered my songs in the night. My heart meditated and my spirit asked, Will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Let's remember what God has done and celebrate that he has the victory. can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Then almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in Shadows, you in every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God and Almighty Fortress. You go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand. 
Psalm 77, 11 through 15. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. Son of God. 
Welcome to our online worship FBC crew. I am so happy that you're here and I am Cedric Gane. I'm so excited that you're joining us tonight. And if you are ready to connect with us, join us at fbcamers.org slash connect. Also, if you're willing to give, if there's something in your heart to give that little bit of change, it don't matter how much or how little, it's awesome that you just give for your heart. It's really in your heart. And we also want to say, join us at fbcamers.org slash give. And I also just want to say, as we connect tonight, I want to say a prayer for us, but I really, really want to say a prayer because our hearts go out to you right now in these times of family and loneliness sometimes and confusion that, listen, right now, this is a time for change, but a change for good and continue to reach out to God. So thank you for joining us. Before I get to the word, I'm going to say a little prayer for us. Father, thank you, God, for who you are. Thank you for our leaders. Right now, we pray for our leadership and guidance. Let every leader not seek to pursue their own interests, but to look at the interests of others. I pray that you help our leaders to identify the needs of your people through divine wisdom and understanding. Lord, help them to be effective leaders and show them how to represent in the area of influence you have given them. And God, I just pray that you continue to sink down in our hearts and truly be with us in the moment today and forever on. Amen. Today's reading is Revelations chapter 12, verses 10 through 12. Amen. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accusers of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They have overcome him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much at the shrink from death. Therefore rejoice your heavens and you who dwell in them, but woe to the earth and the sea because of the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. Amen. Thank you. These have been challenging times but the body of Christ has proven itself resilient. We've gathered in different ways, in different places, yet stood steadfast as the church. We have found peace in God's promise to never leave us or forsake us. In our separation, we have remained united. In our struggle, we have lived out our faith. In the midst of the unknown, we have leaned on the strength of an all-knowing God. Throughout history, the church has thrived in adversity, and this moment is no different. The power of God is unstoppable, His love unending, His grace unrelenting, His glory undeniable. Today, no matter where we gather, we remain God's people. Our mission has not changed. Our calling has not been altered. And nothing, absolutely nothing, will ever change that. We are the church, and today we stand resilient. In so many cultures around the world, there are children's stories. Maybe some of them were read to you when you were a child, or you've read them to your children or to your grandchildren. But there's children's stories or fantasy movies, and the plot line has 
a dragon, usually a huge red fire-breathing dragon who terrorizes the kingdom or the village and everyone's afraid and wonders, is there any hope for the future? Will we be destroyed by the dragon? But then somewhere in the kingdom we read that a child has been born and this child grows up to become a knight in shining armor and leads an army until eventually they slay the dragon. And then you know how it is. The people live happily ever after. Probably most of us have watched fantasy movies or we have uh, read some kind of children's stories with that plot line, but do we know the origin of that story that's found in so many cultures around the world? It's really the storyline of the Bible. Matter of fact, the, the story of the dragon that's finally uh, slayed by uh, the knight in shining armor really goes back to Revelation chapter 12. We're using the vivid imagery of Revelation to help bring truth to life in evocative ways. We read about a dragon who we learn is the devil and a child who's born who we realize is Jesus. And there's a battle where eventually the dragon is slain and, and the battle is really conducted by the church, the followers of the child, the knight in shining armor, Jesus. And as we've come to our Facing the Future sermon series, to the third message, we've devoted the month of January to be preparing to be facing the future together. As we've turned the page of our calendar to 2021, and we realize we still really don't know what the future holds, we're devoting the month of January especially to be preparing to face the future, no matter what may be around the next corner of the path of life, no matter what the future may bring to us. We're exploring ways that God will be preparing us to face the future. And, and as the video that we watched that introduced this sermon this morning, we saw how God is bringing hope and strength and purpose to the church, even in the midst of the COVID pandemic and all of the cultural upheaval that has come throughout the COVID pandemic. And we heard in the video that the church has always thrived in the midst of adversity, that the church has historically been resilient in the midst of challenges. And I pray that'll be true for you and me in our generation, in our time, in our lives, for our church in this challenging moment. So let's join together in Revelation chapter 12. If you need to, to stop the recording, uh, please find in your Bible or cue up your device, Revelation chapter 12, where there's vivid imagery, portraits to help us to understand this gospel storyline of, of this dragon who seems to terrorize the kingdom Oh, but then there's a child who's born who brings together his people for a battle so that they might in eternity live happily ever after. Join me, Revelation chapter 12 uh, in verse 3. And then a sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads, and its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. And the dragon stood in front of the woman uh, about to give birth so it might devour her child the moment that he's born. Now we know from the context, especially from the first couple of verses, that the child to be born is Jesus, the Messiah. And the dragon, if we look down to verse 9, uh, is revealed to us as the devil or Satan or the serpent. Matter of fact, 13 times in the book of Revelation, uh, Satan, the devil, is portrayed as a dragon. Now, before we move forward, I know some people are going to understandably so say, well, what's with the seven heads and the seven crowns and its tail sweeping away a third of the stars? Well, the seven heads and the seven crowns, let's remember in the book of Revelation, the number seven is always about that which is complete. And the portrait is that, that this dragon who is terrorizing the world 
is completely encompassing the earth. Matter of fact, he's everywhere and has enormous power. Matter of fact, the tail, just the tail itself, is portrayed as bringing a third of the stars down out of the sky. Now, obviously, this isn't literal. What this is, portraits. Remember, Revelation is apocalyptic literature, which uses a tremendous amount of portraits and imagery in order to evoke to us understanding what's really happening. And the point is that this enormous red dragon, Satan, the devil, is powerful and has like all-encompassing influence in the world. And the message for us is beware. Be confident in Christ, but be aware that Satan has power. And anytime we flirt with Satan, anytime we flirt with temptations, we realize that we're up against a power that can be so damaging to us. And that any time we entertain flirting with the temptations and the seductions of the dragon, Satan, the devil, sin, so often we can think, oh, those things will bring freedom. You know, I'll have freedom. I won't have to live in God's constraining truth. <laughs> Instead, there will be freedom in this to live like the world. You know, freedom uh, to make any decisions I want. Freedom to be master of my destiny. Freedom to indulge in those pleasures, but so often what Satan sells as freedom really brings us to bondage. And so we need to be aware of Satan's schemes in our world. And notice now how the gospel comes to life, the, the biblical storyline comes to life as we learn that, that the dragon is waiting to devour the child who is portrayed to be Jesus. Oh, how the dragon, Satan, the serpent, the devil, has battled to devour the child, Messiah, Jesus. It began in the Garden of Eden when there was the serpent attempting to disrupt all of God's beauty and perfection. We read throughout the Old Testament three different times where there's an attempt at genocide against God's covenant people, the Hebrew people. Satan was working overtime to destroy God's plan of salvation, to bring Messiah Jesus into the world. Satan, the dragon, the devil then prompted Herod when he realized, oh my goodness, there might be another king. And out of his insecurity, he had all of the children who were male under age two killed. Why? Because once again, the dragons attempting to devour the child. Finally, Jesus is sacrificed. He is killed on the cross, and Satan thinks, oh, the dragon thinks, finally, I've devoured the child. It's over. Remember, throughout Jesus' life, Jesus was so tempted. The dragon, the devil, Satan, three different times in the wilderness, tempted him. Hey, you know, why, why go through all this pain and suffering? You know, why, just, just follow me and I'll give you everything you want, attempting to devour God's mission through the child. And then throughout church history, we've seen persecution. You know, the vast majority of Christ's followers in the 2,000 years since Jesus have lived under persecution, not freedom. And it's true in our world today. But it also comes down to you and me. See, Satan, the dragon, the devil, would love to devour the witness of the child in your life and my life. So Satan's at war with God's people to attempt to devour the witness, the power, and the impact of the child to this day in your and my life. So how can we protect ourselves from the dragon, from Satan, from the devil, in a world that is so often under the influence of the dragon? How can we live as people on purpose of God's redemptive mission, even in the midst of the challenges? Well, the dragon has two primary weapons. This passage kind of unveils for God's people, the church, to see here are the two primary weapons that Satan has in doing battle with you and me for our hearts, our souls, our minds, and our witness to attempt to devour the influence of the child, Messiah, in our generation. And those are deception, and accusation.
Those are the two greatest weapons Satan has in our world today. Deception, accusation. Let's look at each of these and how it impacts our lives today. First of all, with deception. Move down now to verse 7. Where we read tremendous theology uh, about Satan. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. Oh, but he wasn't strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. And so the dragon was hurled down. The ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who deceives the whole world. Do you remember in Luke chapter 10 when Jesus shares, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Matter of fact, Genesis, Isaiah, Jesus in Luke, in 1 Timothy, many other places, but those are most accentuated where we read this same theme of how, of how Satan was a beautiful angel and then attempted to usurp the kingdom, attempted to overthrow God, wanted all the glory and honor attention to himself. And because of that, there was like a war in heaven. Satan lost. Satan was thrown down to the earth. And ever since, Satan, Satan lost the battle. He's been thrown to earth. And now Satan is on his last assault. Angry at God. Bitter. And on the last assault. So how does Satan most battle in Satan's kind of last assault in our world? Through deception. We read that the dragon deceives the whole world. It began all the way back in Genesis chapter 1, right? The serpent who arose said to Adam and Eve, hey, did God really say to you that you can't eat from that tree? And began to deceive them into sin, into what they thought was going to bring freedom, and they realized it brought them into cruel bondage with sin and wreckage. Here's the challenge. Do we hear that deceptive whisper of the dragon, of the devil, of, of Satan, of that serpent in our lives? That deceptive whisper. You might be in the midst of the coronavirus. You know, God isn't really good. Because, you know, would God really allow suffering in our world? God must not be good. Or maybe for some of us who've lost jobs or are battling the financial impact of coronavirus. And it's as if Satan whispers, you know, does God really care for you that he would allow you to lose your job? It might be the loneliness in the midst of the quarantine where Satan whispers to us to deceive us. You know, is God really with you? You feel really lonely. I, I think God's abandoned. I, I don't think God's really with you. Or maybe it's in the midst of our sexual ethics in a culture that is sexually saturated and everywhere we go, we can't miss it. And, and we hear the deceptive whisper, don't God's laws about sexuality seem so archaic? How could you follow that in the 21st century? Or, or maybe when we see injustice, and it seems like injustice is flourishing and it's easy for us to is God real? Satan can easily deceive us. Like, does God even care about justice in our world? But God answers. And the answer here in Revelation 12 is to remind us, God says, yes, I came as the child to defeat the dragon. I came as the child. I came to battle the deceptive voice that can draw you away and destroy your life and damage your witness in the world because the child came to defeat the dragon. Deception is the first of the dragon of Satan's uh, toolbox. The second of the weapons in which Satan wages war with you and me is accusation. Move to verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now I've come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. Deception and now accusation. He's the accuser of the brothers and sisters. That's you and me, accusers of Jesus' brothers and sisters. 
Jesus who came as the child to share life with us and redeem our lives and reconcile us back to the Heavenly Father is not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. He's the accuser who accuses us before God day and night. Because let's remember that the word devil is translated from the Greek word diablos, which means accuser. Literally, devil means the accuser. And, and the portrait throughout Scripture and accentuated here in Revelation 12 is, is a courtroom. It's, it's a forensic scene. And imagine we're in the courtroom of eternity. And the devil is like the prosecuting attorney. The devil is the prosecutor. And he accuses you and me before God and to you and me. And here's, here's the tragedy news. Satan is correct. The dragon's correct. We are guilty of so much in the sight of a holy, pure, and perfect God. But Jesus steps in. You see, the child, the Messiah, has defeated the dragon on the cross and is coming again to completely destroy the dragon. And it's like Jesus steps forward and is our defense attorney and says, oh, wait, wait, Satan, you old serpent, you devil, the dragon, you are out of order. Matter of fact, you've been disbarred from this courtroom because I took their sentence on the cross. So there's nothing left for you to accuse. So here's the challenge for us. Whose voice do we listen to? Do we listen to the voice when the devil accuses you and me? Man, you're, you're too guilty for God to ever love you or, or really receive you home. Hey, don't miss what this world has. Live with the freedom that this world enjoys when those things actually lead to bondage and freedom comes when we honor God and we have a freedom deep within our souls and we'll someday have complete freedom where there will be no sin, where there will be no accusation, where there will be no deception. Do we hear when Satan accuses us, hey, remember those things that you did? You know, let's keep, let's keep downloading those and remembering those. And Jesus says, don't allow those accusations to redefine our identity or cause us to not continue to follow Christ or to trust God. Jesus says, no, I took your sentence on the cross. And so this helps us to understand how the dragon has been defeated, but he's still fighting the battle. Move down to verse 11. So they triumphed, meaning the church, right? The, the, the followers of the child, the Messiah, triumphed over the dragon, Satan, the devil, how? By the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony because they did not lie, love their lives so much as to shrink from death. And now move into verse 12. But woe to the earth, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows his time is short. Here's the message. Rejoice in the victory that was won on the cross and through the resurrection. Rejoice in the victory that the dragon has been defeated but don't ever forget, we still fight the battle. Because even though the dragon has been defeated, the dragon is still in his last desperate breath, fighting a desperate battle against us. And what are the two things that are the weapons of the church? See, the weapons of the church aren't guns or bombs or prison camps. No, first of all, the blood of the lamb that we read about in verse 11. See, if you are a Christ follower, if you're in Christ, if you've chosen to follow Christ, the blood of the lamb of God, Jesus from the cross, covers over and atones for our sin. Don't allow Satan to deceive us, to somehow think we're not God's beloved treasured children, and deceive us to leave the freedom that comes in Christ to the bondage that comes in so much of the sins and anguish of the world. Don't allow Satan to accuse you and me so that we somehow think we've been exempted from God's love and God's grace and being part of the gospel 
story. Because Christ's blood, the blood of the Lamb, has, has covered over all of our sins. And then the second of the weapons for the church, the blood of the Lamb and our testimony. It's fascinating. Now, follow this. In the book of Revelation, we read about a lot of natural disasters that come. So God allows these disasters, right? Seal after seal is open. There's the next disaster. But have you noticed a pattern? The multitude of the world doesn't repent when there's the disasters. It's like God allows some judgments and disasters. People don't repent from that. Matter of fact, many of them gr grit their teeth and they're angry with God. So what is it in the book of Revelation, which we're living in right now and gives us the hope that is to come? It's not the disasters that causes people to, to repent. It's the witness of the church within that suffering and that catastrophe. Now follow this. I think sometimes the church can be lazy. I can, we can be lazy, and this is what I mean. There will be some kind of uh, catastrophe. I don't know, maybe 9-11 happens, or COVID happens, or uh, the racial injustice that has been uh, evoked all over again before us. And it's easy for us to pray, oh God, would you draw people to Christ through this? And then we passively pray and say, okay, God, would you do this? But what God is really saying throughout Scripture, especially here in Revelation, in the entire book of Revelation is, instead God says, look, I've evoked some, I've allowed some things that might capture some people's attention, but what's going to speak to them is not that natural disaster, or uh, if they are diagnosed with cancer, or if someone they love dies, or if they're in an automobile accident, or whatever like that, but that often heightens awareness it's then the witness of God's people within the catastrophe that's the signposts that bring people home to God. So keep praying, but let's also remember that every temptation that happens to us, every catastrophe that comes upon our world, through that we can either yield to those things and defame the reputation of Jesus and just push people further away from God. Every temptation, every suffering challenge that comes to us, we can yield to that and we can really feed the dragon. Or in the midst of temptation or catastrophe or suffering, we can offer a witness to the world of what love and servanthood and justice and grace and strength in the midst of suffering can really be all about. It's our witness in the midst. It's so often that in the midst of adversity that the church is resilient and that the greatest witness comes to the world. The greatest witness that if, if we want revival, keep on praying, but let me tell you something. God didn't say, so you just passive. Most great revivals have come in the midst of pain, suffering, and catastrophe. That's when the church can arise and be the church. The hands, the feet, the voice of Jesus in the midst of catastrophe. That's when the gospel shines most powerfully. So it brings a challenging theological question. Has Satan been defeated? The answer is yes. On the cross, Satan was disarmed. And through the resurrection, it proved that Satan doesn't have dominion. But God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit do. But let's remember that Satan, the serpent, the devil's not, not dead. Defeated, but not dead, because the battle continues to rage. Recently, I watched a documentary that uh, highlighted a part, uh, a horrifying part of World War II that was the Battle of the Bulge. Nazi Germany was completely defeated. Almost everyone in Germany knew, the world knew, that, that the map was shriveling. You know, east and western fronts were closing toward Berlin. It was only a matter of time. But Adolf Hitler, in his, in his evil and in, in his warped mind, became so desperate that 
that he took even even 13 14 15 year old kids uh, 60 year old veterans who'd fought in world war one and brought them all out and armed them and took everything that they had for one less and it was horrific and it delayed the end of the war by six to seven months and there were hundreds of thousands of people who died and that's kind of a portrait of what Satan's do. Satan knows he's lost. But he's angry. He's bitter at God. And so the dragon continues to fight the battle. And so here's the challenging question. How can we slay the dragon? God has called the church to be his representatives in slaying the dragon. And there's three ways that we slay the dragon. First of all, we don't yield to deception when the dragon attempts to deceive us. Second of all, we don't yield to accusation when the dragon, Satan, accuses us and it could cause us to lose our faith or wander away from Christ or not stay in the spiritual battle. And the third thing is that we offer a testimony the followers of Christ, the tribe of Jesus, offering a testimony of love and grace and service and hope in the midst of the suffering and the challenges of life. That's our calling, brothers and sisters, as the church. May this be the finest hour for the church as we love and serve and give and advocate for justice and one life at a time, as the hands, the feet, and the voice of Jesus, we serve. Remember that every temptation, every challenge we face, we either defame the reputation of Jesus and feed the dragon, or we offer a witness in our world starving for hope. Brothers and sisters, let's continue to be the church. And may this be the finest hour of our generation, this moment. I love you, my church family. May we continue to be a church that loves, cares for each other, even across the miles. Glory be to God, now and forever. Amen. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe his craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal
for God hath will His truth to triumph through us And though this world with devils fill Should threaten to undo us We will not be for God striving would be losing 